This is an exercise that I call matching. Now, I know that you don't get matching questions um, on the National Registry, but I think it's really important that we uh, go through and look for things that are important in what we do. And this is going to give us practice in looking at clues and how we pick the right answer. Because what you're going to find in National Registry Style Questions, that every thing that's written there makes a difference. And if we can pick out the important things, then we can get the answer correct. It's not just reading the question. And it really isn't just identifying the important things. There's also the concept of valuing things. Which of these is more important than the other, right? So I've got four of these, and I want to go through and we'll, we'll break these down individually. So I have a patient in a motorcycle crash who's hypotensive. All right, so hypotensive with diminished lung sounds. All right. Now, diminished lung sounds is important in his right lower lung lobe. Ooh, that's interesting. Patient was stabbed in the chest. He's hypotensive and he has normal breath sounds. There's a patient with a history of emphysema, makes me think he's probably older. And he has diminished lung sounds, but that's in the left lung apex. And then an unrestrained driver in a car crash. Well, that's not good. He's unresponsive with diminished breath sounds on his left side, and he has distended neck veins. Now, all this stuff here, that might be important. He's unresponsive. It shows a certain amount of criticality, right? So let's figure this out. Now, my choices, I gotta match these with my patients. Pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and hemothorax. How am I gonna figure this out? Well, let's go through again, now that we know the choices. Motorcycle crash is hypotensive, probably blood loss. And he has diminished lung sounds in his right lower lung lobe. Right, so it's lower. What goes into the lower lobes? Fluid or blood, right? What's going to go to the, to the base of the lung in that plural space? We're going to find that he has diminished lung sounds in his right lower lung lobe. And I'm going to say that this is going to be my hemothorax patient. Now, remember that when you go through these, you can see if later we can go back and look at them and check. But a patient was stabbed in the chest. He's hypotensive again, and he has normal breath sounds. All right, so what would cause hypotension in this case with normal breath sounds? And the fact that he's stabbed actually is a clue as well. Now, my choices are pneumothorax, tension, pneumothorax, and tamponade. Both pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax wouldn't have normal breath sounds. He's hypotensive, which fits with tamponade, right? But stabbed in the chest, right, that is one of the leading causes of tamponade, right? So we've now got C here. So now I've got two more. A patient with a history of emphysema he has diminished lung sounds in the left lung apex. Now, the last one, unrestrained drivers, unresponsive, diminished breath sounds, distended neck veins. Well, what's going to have the distended neck veins, right? And unresponsiveness, that's really, really a sick patient. Well, that's going to be the tension pneumothorax. And our emphysema patient, probably ruptured a bleb, it has diminished lung sounds only in the apex, and that's usually where the pneumothorax shows. So now we have. D, C, A, B. So this gives us practice in looking at what's important. Now, what really did this for us? What part of the lung that it occurred in? Hypotensive, distended neck veins, right? Which shows us that's tamponade. So all of these things, all of these words are the things that help us identify these conditions. And if you see these in the test question, that's going to help you identify those 
conditions or help tell you the severity of the patient and what to do on a national registry style test question. All right, patient matching. We have four patient presentations. And we have four potential conditions. We have a 16-year-old patient who says her inhaler isn't working. What I like about this exercise is it really kind of shows you how important age can be. And she has an inhaler. I'm going to read these first, even before I look at the choices. Here's somebody who's 76, and he awoke from sleep at 3 a.m., and he can't catch his breath. Here's another uh, geriatric patient whose phlegm turned dark and he's on home oxygen. Okay. And a 54 year old woman, productive cough for three days. Okay. So I picked out what I think is important. Let's look at the choices pneumonia, pulmonary edema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. All right, now nothing, no one thing should lead us to choose. We should find the way things all fit together. But somebody who's 16, I wouldn't expect pulmonary edema, and I wouldn't expect chronic bronchitis. And if somebody says her inhaler isn't working, that's going to lead me, being a young patient with inhaler, to think asthma. That might, generally, any question you get, there's something that you rule in or rule out pretty quickly, but you always read all the choices. Now we have pulmonary edema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. Now picture the chronic bronchitis patient. This goes on for a long time. And what would make me think that something is a chronic condition? The fact that he's on home oxygen. What makes um, COPD worse? Usually a respiratory infection. Infections anywhere can make it work. His phlegm turned dark. So this is my chronic bronchitis patient here. Now I've got two left. I've got A and I have B. So a 76-year-old man who awoke from sleep at 3 a.m. unable to catch his breath. And a woman, 54, she has a productive cough for three days. So which one of these comes on suddenly and which one of these comes on gradually? Right? That's a really important thing. The onset, the events the part of our exam is really important. Productive cough for three days says that she's got some problems. That productive cough to me says pneumonia. And that means that pulmonary edema here is the 76-year-old man who woke from sleep at 3 a.m. unable to catch his breath, which is a classic presentation of pulmonary edema. You know, you sometimes you sleep on pillows, you fall asleep, you're not in your pillows, you've got fluid in your lungs, and it just, you wake up and you can't breathe. You find them with their feet dangling off the bed in the tripod position at three o'clock in the morning. See how we're using clues here? I don't ever overlook the age, right? Inhaler isn't working, right? So that gives us asthma. I woke from sleep at 3 a.m., he's unable to catch his breath. Oh, classic pulmonary edema. His phlegm turned dark on home oxygen. That's chronic bronchitis. And then pneumonia, productive cough for three days. Right? That all, everything makes a difference. Every clue in these makes a difference. All right? Matching presentations. Here we go. So let's look at these things. Now, this age, look at this, 19-year-old, a college student, has pain around the umbilicus, the belly button. There's a 56-year-old guy. He has colicky pain. It's cramping pain. It's after a fatty meal. Right? You've probably seen where that's going, I hope, anyways. 76-year-old man, he complains of a tearing pain in his back. And... 36-year-old woman, who vomited blood, coffee grounds in it. All right, so these we should be able to pick apart. Now, if there's some of them you don't know, remember to always go back and look them up in your book. 
if there's something you say, oh, I didn't know this one particular sign and symptom had to do with this particular condition, you know, look it up, right? So now you're probably going to find one of these and it's going to just ding, 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 ding. He's going to figure out exactly what you need. So in this case, maybe it's tearing pain, right? Tearing or ripping pain is a, is a classic thing we associate with the aortic aneurysm, right? So he's 76. That, you know, you get, the older you get, the more you're likely to have them. The tearing pain is important. But in the abdomen, the aorta is somewhat retroperitoneal. It's out of the abdominal cavity towards the back. So that even makes that more likely, right? So we've got this. That's the one that we say, okay, that one's easy. And then if you look at cholecystitis, appendicitis, gastric ulcer, ulcer, vomited blood, coffee grounds, right? Coffee grounds is ultimately digested blood. The other way we might see digested blood is when we have a bowel movement it's called melina, dark, tarry, uh, extra foul smelling stool. Um, generally, it would be a lower GI bleed. It's bleeding from someplace else in the GI tract. It moves through, but that blood is digested. So we vomit coffee grounds. We have dark, tarry, uh, foul-smelling stool. That often indicates GI bleeding. But, you know, she's, you know, 36, vomited blood, coffee grounds. I think you're probably saying, holy cow, it's gastric ulcer. Right? And these, these really kind of stand out from each other. So now we have cholecystitis, you know, we have a gallbladder uh, issue, or appendicitis. Now, you're probably saying the 19-year-old uh, college student pain around the belly button. Hopefully, you recognize that uh, appendicitis pain can actually start around the belly button. But then as the appendix gets big and hot and pussy, or maybe ruptures, it starts, it starts knocking on the, uh, the peritoneum, and we start to really be able to localize that pain and it goes down to McBurney's point in the lower right quadrant. But young pain around the umbilicus hopefully made you say appendicitis. So then if we've got that, we say, okay, I didn't recognize that that cramping, colicky pain after a fatty meal really is classic uh, gallbladder things. If you didn't know that, well, we learned something here too. That we in fact have... Um, these now we were able to take. But what have we learned from this? That the description of the pain, right? If you look at this, pain around the belly button, colicky cramping pain after a fatty meal. Think about the, uh, the events and the assessment that's needed to get these. And that tearing pain, right? So all these things should make you, like I said, should make you say, oh, that's not guaranteed, but it should make you think that way. Then we have the 36-year-old woman who vomited blood with coffee grounds. That may be the one you went towards first, but that's the gastric ulcer. So we've got all of these taken care of now, and we've learned about how important these things are in questions. These complaints, these signs, these symptoms, they all point in a direction. The National Registry doesn't, doesn't hammer you over the head with it. Right? So this helps us pick out things that are very important in questions. All right, let's match the presentation from the list of conditions below. And I'm Dan Limmer from Limmer Education. And we have four patients, we have four conditions. And I'd like you to handle this kind of like I'd like you to handle the National Registry. Read all the questions first, and then look at the choices. Don't jump because you might pick something that doesn't fit. Now, these are all 19 year old males. We're going to make it challenging that way. 19-year-old male is found unresponsive in a motel. His respiratory rate is eight a minute. So everybody's 19, right? The age always makes a difference. In this case, they're all 19. He's found unresponsive. Now, in a motel, may or may not make a difference, right? His respiratory rate is eight per minute. So he's hypoventilating. Okay. So a 19-year-old male is agitated. And he has pale, sweaty skin. 19-year-old male is semi-conscious, and he's bitten his tongue. 19-year-old male appears confused, he has chills, and his respiratory rate is 24 a minute. Now, 
what I like about this is that everybody's 19 and these um, these conditions all will make sense but I think this might be one of the more challenging sets that I've given you all right so let's see if most of the time if we're gonna pick one we'll look at it and say young guy in a motel breathing slowly that kind of makes me say opioid overdose right so let's say we'll pencil that one in opioid overdose we're gonna just do that so now I've got hypoglycemia seizure and sepsis now the other one that might have made you pick it first is the seizure why he bit his tongue now this semi-conscious well that's probably the postictal state he's coming back around so unconscious he bit his tongue I'm going to say that that one is the seizure. And this this rationalization, by the way, and going through and picking these and choosing and crossing them off the list um, is a good thought process to go through. I think a little bit of differential diagnosis here, a little bit of exam preparation for doing this, picking out the most important things, really, like we would on a patient and a test question, uh, and we're identifying what's important here. So now I have an agitated... 19 year old who has pale sweaty skin and I've got a 19 year old who is confused and has chills and he's breathing rapidly well if I look at this now I know I have sepsis I have hypoglycemia I would say that the hypoglycemia is more likely to have the agitated uh, unusual outrageous behavior and that does match with pale sweaty skin right when when the body tries to uh, liberate um, stores of uh, glycogen from the body it uses the sympathetic nervous system that fight or flight the things that we use uh, uh, hypoglycemia used to be called insulin shock because it had signs and symptoms of shock so the agitated 19 year old with pale sweaty skin I'd say well that's probably the hypoglycemia but let me just make sure 19 year old appears confused okay sepsis is the choice and altered mental status often one of the first things you see chills kind of tells me fever and rapid respiratory rate is part of a lot of the sepsis assessments that physicians use so i'm going to say that hypoglycemia is the agitated pale sweaty skin and that sepsis is the confused chills because of the fever altered mental status rapid respiratory rate really kind of matches that sepsis pattern that we look at everything really now seems to line up and what have we learned well in the first one it was the hypoventilation that told us bizarre behavior and pale sweaty skin was hypoglycemia bit in his tongue right oh that's pretty close to seizures right there um and he's semi-conscious that says well he's probably postictal and then we have altered mental status chills might be a fever rapid respiratory rate says sepsis all right so in this not only did we go through and separate these conditions out and what was a relatively challenging exercise but we learned a lot about words and conditions and signs and symptoms that we can use to help identify conditions, severity, uh, and other things in national register restyle questions, as well as our patients. I would even venture to say that while we, uh, a lot of people like to talk about the national registry and say how it's not, um, it's valid or it's trickery or it's you know any number of things. We love to be mad at the registry. The truth is, is that they ask you to do ultimately what you do in the field, give you a patient presentation, where you find multiple signs and symptoms and figure out what's most important. Stay safe, be careful, got to take care of each other, and make sure we take some time for ourselves, get some studying in, but don't forget the importance of, uh, of adjustment, of de-stressing. Do something for yourself before you take the National Registry.